Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webcast, Best Practices for Spray-Dry Dispersion Formulation Selection and Early Development. I'm Rita Peters, Editorial Director of Pharmaceutical Technology and the moderator for today's event. We're pleased to bring you this web seminar presented by Pharmaceutical Technology and sponsored by Lanza Pharma and Biotech. As a leader for contract development and manufacturing, Lanza Pharma and Biotech is recognized for reliable, high-quality services, global capacity, innovative technology platforms, and extensive experience. The company's broad capabilities span across biologics, small molecules, bioconjugates, and cell and gene therapies. To find out more, you can visit them on the web at www.lanza.com. I have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit your question by typing it in the Q&A box, which can be found on the right-hand side of your screen. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the small green icon in the upper right-hand corner of the slide window, or by hovering your mouse over the lower right-hand corner and dragging the window to the desired size. The slides will advance automatically during the event. And should you have any technical problems viewing or hearing the presentation, please click on the question mark help widget in the dock at the bottom of your presentation window. Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Ian Yates is a product development lead at Lanza Bend. He is responsible for leading spray-dried dispersion formulation efforts on early drug development programs from preclinical through phase two clinical trials. His primary areas of expertise are in amorphous dispersion formulation development, including drug speciation, absorption, performance, and stability. Ian has been with the company since 2009. He graduated with a master's degree in chemistry and a material science focus from the University of Oregon. Thank you for joining us, Ian. You have the floor. Thanks, Rita. Um, I guess we can just jump right in. Uh, the topic is best practices for spray dry dispersion formulation selection and early development. So um, a, lot, a lot of the focus here will be on how decisions are made early on and uh, and then how we do the first round of spray drying and uh, how we characterize them. So th this slide is kind of an introduction to Lanza and what we offer. We have a pretty comprehensive offering of, across the entire product development cycle. So um, from the design phase through the development um, all the way through final manufacture and we have greater than 300 projects in development and uh, over 200 products um, in the, in the uh, commercial manufacturing stage throughout the LONS organization. And we cover drug substance intermediates, drug substances, drug product intermediates, as well as the final dosage form. And today, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll cover the design of the uh, drug product intermediates. So I'll get right into the outline. Um, first, I'll kind of go over uh, solubilization and SDD overview as a kind of a refresher. Um, going into the next point is the uh, problem statement identification formulation selection. So how do we do, how do, how do we formulate and how do we make the decisions that we make when, when we're in the early phase? And then I'll, I'll go into a little detail on pre-formulation assessment. So um, what, what, what work do we do before we actually make any of the formulations? So first, what, what do we need to know about the molecule? And I'll go into a little bit of technical detail on um, the fraction absorbed classification system outlined by Sagano and how we use that uh, for formulation decision making. Um, after that, we'll go into a few uh, case studies, not case studies, but uh, common candidate types, common drug types with certain drug properties that we that we see often and uh, how that fits into the classification system and, and how the decision gets made based on the molecular properties. And then finally, after we make um, a formulation, what tests do we go and do to, to test the hypotheses and to uh, make sure that we're creating the best formulation? And I put a quote here on the bottom, which is kind of the mantra of early dev. Uh, 
which is uh, we aim to learn as much as we can to deliver the best formulation possible in a time and cost effective manner. I think I wanted to point that out because it, it, it's important not to just pick the formulation that performs the best in vivo, but also position it for uh, as, as optimized the late stage development with respect to stability, manufacturing, and performance. And I'll get into that uh, in detail as we go forward. So this slide is kind of highlighting what, what enabling technologies are available for solubilization, and, and there's many choices. Um, crystal form, size reduction, amorphous, <clears throat> which is what the, prim the primary goal of this uh, webinar is today, and also solvation. And, and we offer these at Lonza. Um, so the, the next slide is um, kind of an overview of where uh, amorphous dispersions and, and other solubilization technologies fit on a, a, a map of solubility versus lipophilicity. <clears throat> And, and, and really the point here is to show that the amorphous space is, is pretty broad. Um, many new drug candidates fall into the space where, where solubilization tech, technology excels and amor amorphous drug dispersions are really versatile. Um, so th this slide kind of is just an overview on what a, uh, an SDD is or a spray dry dispersion. So, First, what is important is the process. So, so just to go through it real quickly, um, a, a drug and a polymer are dissolved in a solvent, pumped into um, a nozzle where, where droplets are atomized, and then a drying gas quickly dries those droplets into particles, which hopefully are amorphous. Um, and, then, and then there's a, a number of characterization tools that we use to assess the physical state. So what, what is the product? Is it amorphous? Um, and, and does it perform better than the crystalline? And, and how much better does it perform versus the crystalline? I think under, understanding the performance related to the problem statement in early dev is what's really important, and, and we'll get into that in a lot of detail as we go forward. But uh, something to keep in mind is, is that metrics for performance can, can vary a lot depending on the molecular properties. Um, some of the physical characterization and uh, early manufacturing can be you know, more, a little more routine, um, something we, we check and we, we kind of check consistently throughout. But when it comes to performance, I think the metrics is kind of a, a, moving, a moving target depending on what the molecular properties are. So I think the, the point of this talk is that to go through how we address that. So this, is, this right here, is uh, just to, what we're showing is what we, what we can do over a wide scale range for manufacturing spray dry dispersions. So um, at, at the very small scale here in Bend, we have a mini spray dryer that can spray dry batches down to, you know, 25 to 100 milligrams of, of total material. Um, we can scale that up to the lab scale dryer, which th these two small dryers are what we normally use at the early phase. Um, and then as we progress, we scale up to uh, the pilot scale to, and then further to commercial scale, hopefully indicating that the project is, is becoming successful. And we, we offer uh, the, the three largest dryers, both in development and GMP. So here are um, just a list of some of the functional excipients that we commonly use in, in a spray dry dispersion. Um, Oligrigate polymers uh, in the top left there, methacrylic acid copolymer, uh, HPNCT, HPNCAS, those, those are commonly uh, used excipients with acid functionality, as well as some neutral polymers like PVP, HPNC, and PVPVA. Um, and, and the choice on what we use is very, very dependent on the problem statement. Um, for instance, um, you, you may avoid acidic functionality if you expect to have acid catalyzed degradation. Um, HP and CAS is a great polymer for fast crystallizers and, and maintaining supersaturation. Um, gastric precipitation actually is uh, sometimes yields itself to use the neutral polymer so that you get dissolution in the gastric phase. Or sometimes oidrigate, which is um, very acidic and doesn't release the drug in the gastric phase, which can also be beneficial. 
Um, gastric dissolution rate may yield itself to PVP, if that's the problem statement. And sometimes certain drugs have uh, interactions with polymers that are uh, suppress the solubility. So we, we try and take all these things into account in early development so that we can pick um, the best polymer that suits the problem. And this is a slide we use to kind of show what, what the three key components are to, to a good SDD formulation. Um, performance, manufacturer, and stability. Um, when it comes to performance, you know, what's really key is identifying what the problem statement is. Um, we have a battery of in vitro performance tests that, that we use, and we, we try to use the right ones and design the right tests to tackle the specific problem statement. And again, I'll get into this in more detail, and uh, it, it, I think it's probably the most important part for the early, um, early development. But having said that, um, keeping an eye on stability and manufacturability are something that we must keep in mind. And we're all, despite trying to formulate around performance initially, um, we all we are always being mindful of what, what the stability is. So we, we we do predictive modeling. We can do phase diagrams to to determine what the solubility of the polymer and the, the drug in the polymer is. And then, as well as accelerated stability. That, that's routine work in the early phase. In terms of manufacturability, um, defining the solvent system, key process parameters such as solid loading, what the throughput expectations are, um, are, are, are examples of what we keep in mind at early, early, early development prior to trying to scale up. And, and also to mention, we, we do have enabling technologies for compounds with poor organic solubility which I'll touch on a little bit when I go through the case studies, but um, yeah, but, so again, performance uh, may not be readily apparent and requires some investigation, which is the bulk of what we do in early phase development. So this, um, this slide is kind of, well, I'll take you through it step at a time, but th this will kind of go through how we do problem statement identification and formulation selection uh, here, here at Lonza Bend. Um, so, so first, and, and really importantly, is the pre-formulation assessment. And I'll, again, I'll get into this in more detail, but this is kind of a high-level overview. Um, this often is the work that we do prior to making anything, um, prior to doing any manufacturing, assessing the molecule and its properties and informing what decisions that we're going to make. So first, we, we like to collect and measure um, as appropriate physical chemical properties associated with the drug. So thermal properties, solubility, um, aqueous solubility, organic, amorphous solubility, which I'll touch on, and also solubility in biorelevant media. All four of those things are important. Um, what the target product profile is, so dose is one of the most important things, and, and, and in early dev it's not always known what the dose is. But dose ranges um, are, are oftentimes important, as well as what animal model that we're going to be using early. Um, knowing what the dose in the gastric phase is primarily is, is of great importance to designing the right tests. Others as well, um, diffusion coefficient, effective permeability, and any in vivo data, those can be measured, those can be calculated as well um, using uh, using software related to the uh, chemical structure. And from that, we can, we can start mapping this molecule so that we can kind of get a sense of what the challenges are. So this map here on the left is something everybody's probably seen, is the, the DCS, the Developability Classification System. That's pretty useful, um, as well as a map that we've used here in Bend a long time, the TM over TG versus log P map, which can give us a sense of what we might expect in terms of and physical stability particularly. <clears throat> and then finally at the bottom, we do, we do several other calculations, one um, being the FACS, which I mentioned in the outline, the Fraction Absorbed Classification System, and we'll get into that in detail, as well as MAD calculation, which is kind of a rudimentary biomodel to try and give yourself an idea on what you might expect in terms of bioavailability enhancement from the amorphous form versus the crystalline. Um, to go back to the physical chemical properties, some, some of those, that, some, it's really useful for us to get some of those from the client, but we do 
we do manufacture, we do uh, make those measurements as necessary as, as part of our pre-formulation assessment. And again, the amorphous solubility test is something that we do that I think pretty unique and I'll, and I'll get into. So from, from that pre-formulation assessment, we go into manufacture and screening. So we'll, we'll make some formulation based on what we found out and assess the manufacturability, um, bio performance, and physical chemical stability. So in terms of manufacturability, it's, it's important that we're mindful of scalability and identifying key process parameters, uh, operating temperatures, solid loading, solvent system, and uh, where we're at in terms of the solubility of the drug in the organic um, uh, solution. Bioperformance, I'll, I'll get into this again, but um, we, we offer a suite of tests that we try and uh, tailor to the problem statement that we've identified in the pre-formulation assessment. And finally, stability. Um, Typically, at the early phase, we'll do accelerated stability from anywhere ranging from one week to three months. Um, and then there, there are faster options depending on uh, where, the, where the program is. So for instance, the, the ASAP for uh, chemical stability is something that we use. And, uh, and we do do things like phase diagrams and, and a, a TAM accelerated stability uh, protocol for, for trying to do as early prediction of, of stability as we can um, to, to see basically what might happen after a two-year time frame. But again, I want to highlight here that um, the due diligence and the pre-formulation assessment um, can minimize a lot of the unknowns that happen at this manufacturing screening, and that really can give you a, a cost and time reduction in the early development, as, as well as data that's frankly more valuable and uh, more relevant to, to your to your program than if you hadn't done a rigorous pre-formulation assessment. And finally, um, from that screening, we, we, would, we would normally do a PK study. And from what we learn in the PK study, we would then look to optimize the tests, analyze the data, and, and see if, if what, what we expected happened or not happened, and then uh, try to redefine the, uh, the problem statement as necessary. We, we do do more sophisticated biomodeling using Gastro Plus at this stage, typically not at the very early stages, but as that becomes necessary, that, that's, that's something we look to do, as well as uh, scale-up activities and, and, and dosage form development. So I'll go into a little detail now about what we do in the pre-formulation assessment. So a lot of it is data collection and trying to, to compile all all of what's known about the molecule and, and fill in the gaps as we see necessary. So first, um, a, lo a lot of what we get is, is related to the target product profile. So what, do, what, are, we, what are we trying to achieve? Um, so first, you know, what clinical phase are we in? Uh, second, what's the dose? Um, what's the dosing frequency and, and what's the in vivo model? Is it a rat, is it a dog, a monkey or a human? Um, what, what, are we, what are we trying to achieve? Oftentimes, um, you want to just achieve high exposure for toxicity reasons, um, and so you'd be really gearing around trying to tailor your formulation to what exposure would be in a rat at very high doses. Oftentimes, you're looking to actually increase bioavailability in a human for clinical studies. So keeping that in mind is something that's, that is, is really important. Um, pharmacokinetics. So. Um, Absolute bioavailability, bioavailability as a function of dose, is there a food effect, is there a gastric pH effect? Getting that information from clients is very useful for us um, to try and, again, define the problem statement. And solubility, obviously, is very important, and we measure these as well as take uh, client data, but um, uh, amorph amorphous solubility calculations and measurement before we actually make any spray dry dispersions is something that we um, typically do in an early phase. Uh, what's the aqueous solubility challenge? Um, a, a molecule may be a solubility challenge because it's oily or very lipophilic, um, but it also may be solubility challenge because it has a high crystal lattice energy and, uh, and usually that manifests itself as a high melting point. While those are both um, require solubilization technologies, they require different approaches to accomplishing that goal. Um, 
Um, physical and chemical stability, which I've touched on, um, we, we take in as much data as we can. Is there forced degradation? Um, oftentimes, early development, there's not. Um, but we do take a look at the molecule and see, is there anything that in, our, in our experience that we've seen that usually lends itself to poor chemical stability? And, and from that, what polymers do we select? Well, physical stability, we often do this in early development ourselves where we, uh, we both do thermal analyses on the drug, get, get the degradation temperature, melt, um, glass transition, as well as recrystallization temperature. That, that all of those are important. And finally, um, permeability. Uh, this, is, this is an interesting one that could, I could probably talk about for the whole time, but um, really, oftentimes early development, we, we, have a, we use the ADMET software to predict what we expect the permeability to be based on what the chemical properties are. Um, but also, if, if data is available, CACO2 and, and animal, typically rat perfusion data is available, that gives us a sign on on um, where we're at potentially in terms of permeability, and, and that's a big that's a big part of this. So I'll, I'll get into a little, a little more on that. So um, I'm going to introduce the, the fraction absorbed classification system, which is really good work by Sagano and, and, and colleagues about trying to use some of these inputs early on to define what the rate limiting steps are for absorption and it's something we're using a lot more and, it, and, it, and it's really helpful because already by the time we're making the first formulations we know what problem we're trying to solve. So the key inputs here are crystalline aqueous solubility, amorphous solubility, projected dose or dose range, what the animal is, what the log P or micelle partition is, and, and what uh, the permeability is. And, and from those inputs, you can calculate three dimensionless numbers. Uh, first, the dose number. So what the dose number means in English, how many volumes of the GI tract are required to dissolve the dose, or how many turnovers do you need um, to dissolve the entire dose? The, uh, the dose number is defined as the dose over volume over the solubility. So if the dose is really high relative to the solubility, your dose number will be very high. Um, and this is common for low solubility compounds that have high dose numbers because the solubility is low relative to the, the dose. Um, permeation number, um, it's the rate of absorption um, times the transit time. And so what that means is how many times can the drug permeate over the course of GI transit? So if the permeation number is high and permeability is better and the permeation no number is higher, Similar to the dissolution number, how many times can the drug dissolve over the course of GI transit? The dissolution number is high. That means dissolution rate is fast. So from those, um, from those uh, dimensionless numbers, there's three primary uh, limiting cases that you can define from that. The first being dissolution rate limited. So um, just to highlight what the, the picture means. The, the dots represent undissolved drug. The blue space represents dissolved drug. The arrows represent the rate at which um, one species is going to the other, so converting from some undissolved drug to dissolved drug to absorbed drug. Um, the lines represent uh, the bloodstream. And then the number of dots represent if it's a sink versus a non-sink. So in, in the case of dissolution rate limited, your, your dissolution number is below your permeability over your dose number. So cases when this occurs is if, if permeability is high relative to dose and solubility, which makes that PN over DO value greater than the dissolution number. So um, again, this would happen if the drug is permeable um, and if your, if your dose number is potentially low, meaning your, your dose is low and your solubility is high. Um, oftentimes, when we get a low solubility compound, this is not the case, and, and I'll get into that as we go forward. The second case is the permeability limited. So if the, if the permeability is less, permeability number is less than the dissolution number, and the dose number is below one. 
And uh, that's an important point because for the dose number to be below one, um, the dose is low relative to the solubility. So that means if the dose number is low, uh, below one, you only have to turn the drug over one time in the GI um, to get the, the full dose dissolved. And for low solubility compounds, again, obviously that's not, that's not usually the case. And then finally, uh, and, and the case that we deal with the most is uh, the per solubility permeability limited case. The, the PN over DO is less than the dissolution number, meaning uh, the dose is, uh, the permeability is low relative to the dose and solubility, and the dose number being greater than one, meaning you have to have multiple turnovers to dissolve the entire dose. Um, further, there's a note underneath that uh, case three, the solubility permeability limited case can be broken further down into uh, solubility limited, solubility epithelial limited, and solubility unstirred water layer limited. And uh, the reason for that is the, the permeability is, is a function of both permeability across the unstirred water layer and the epithelium. And uh, it's designated as SLE or SLU depending on which of those terms is the dominant uh, term in ter in relative to effective permeability. So having all that in mind, I've highlighted that case and uh, uh, these cases, so SLU and SLE are analogous to BCS2 and 4, so BCS2 being low solubility, high permeability, and 4 being um, low solubility, low permeability, and, uh, and, and SDD or an amorphous dispersion can help by both, help both of those cases by decreasing the dose number, and, and by decreasing the dose number, that means increasing the solubility and increasing dissolution number um, because of both the solubility and um, fast dissolution that an SDD um, gives. So this slide is uh, another representation of that. So uh, in the first case, uh, in the dissolution rate limited case on the left, you've got uh, solid primary particles in the first tower, dissolved drug in the middle tower, and absorbed drug in the bottom tower. Um, the reason the top tower is full is because the rate at which particles can dissolve is slow, and so most of your drug is locked up in the solid state, and you're waiting for those to dissolve before they can absorb. In the permeation limited case in the middle, um, dissolution rate is fast, so there's very few solid primary particles, but most of your drug is dissolved because it's waiting to permeate. In the case of solubility limited, um, the rate of dissolution and permeation aren't limiting, but what's limiting is the, the tower height of the dissolved drug is low, and so you can only get so much into that tower before you can't, your solubility is limiting. So again, what we can do with a, an amorphous dispersion is increase that tower height and increase the rate at which solid primary particles um, go to dissolved drug, and uh, that's that's really what tuning handles we have by making an amorphous dispersion. Um, so I'll get into some, some common drug candidates. So, so the first one is a poorly soluble lipophilic drug, um, which most people have seen. And uh, some example inputs for a drug like this are low solubility, so about one microgram per mil, um, amorphous solubility enhancement of about tenfold, which is a common for this type of drug, a projected dose of 100 milligrams, um, a log P of four and a relatively high effective permeability. <clears throat> I fixed a few variables and I'm not going to discuss them, such as molecular weight and diffusivity, um, but, but these inputs are the ones that are um, dynamic for the examples I'm going to show. So what are the outputs using the uh, FACS? So um, in this table, we've got a particle size in the top row, dose number, permeation number, dissolution number, uh, permeation number over dis uh, overdose number, which is another term in the uh, to determine what the rate limiting step is, um, what the classification is, and then finally what the predicted fraction absorbed will will be. Um, that fraction absorbed is explained in the Sagano literature pretty clearly, uh, but for brevity's sake, I, I, I'm not going to go into how how that's derived. But um, I'm happy to discuss that after the after this uh, meeting if, if desired. So what I'm showing here in the table is uh, all three of these columns are, are crystalline forms of the drug with decreasing particle size. So 
really what, what I'm showing here is what the effect of micronization would be on the drug um, relative to this classification system. So on the far right is the largest particle size. And uh, what you'll notice is what's changing in terms of the Sagano parameters are the dissolution number because we're reducing particle size. And the dissolution number is calculated using a noise Whitney um, standard calculation of dissolution rate per crystal. So DN is increasing as you uh, get smaller in particle size, not surprising. But what you'll notice is for the largest crystal size, um, the DN is smaller than the PN over DL. And as you get smaller, that DN gets larger and larger, and eventually it's, it's so much larger that the relative uh, DN versus PN over DO is about the same. And so what you see in the, the classification system is that we're dissolution rate limited um, at the large particle size because the DN is smaller than the PN over DO. But at some point, you, you micronize and you make that DN so large that you don't get much gain by further um, reducing particle size. Um, when you add the amorphous column, what you're doing is not only, um, not only having an impact on DN, but you're also reducing your DO because you've increased your solubility uh, tenfold, as I uh, put over on the inputs on the left. Um, and so, as a result, you get a higher fraction absorbed, and you're still dissolution rate limited, even at this dose. Um, so you could you could conceivably reduce particle size in this case. If the dose were to become higher, the dose number would increase, and you may um, you may start to to not be 100% predicted absorbed, but um, yeah, uh, I guess and other things to consider for a drug like this are, are written on the bottom left as well. So gastric precipitation for neutral is, is important because the solubility in the gastric phase is going to be lower than it is in the intestinal phase. So your supersaturation ratio may be higher in gastric. So gastric precipitation is something to watch out for. Gastric to intestinal transfer, if, if, if you have a basic molecule, is important because you'll have high solubility in the gastric, and you'll have to uh, sustain massive supersaturation once you transfer to the low solubility intestinal environment. Um, gastric pH effect, of course, is important. Um, food effect, uh, because micellar drug for, for a, a drug candidate like this is, is important, and so when you eat, you have more micelles and more carriers to um, to improve that solubility value. Uh, dissolution rate and, and colloid formation as well. Um, colloids, we, we typically also refer to as drug polymer um, aggregates or drug polymer nano, nano aggregates. Um, so certain polymers, such as HPMCAS, promote the formation of these um, nano aggregates or colloids. And in, in cases like this, with a lipophilic poorly soluble compound, those species are very important. The next case is brick dust, <clears throat> which most people have seen as well. Um, the inputs are similar, but there, there's a few things different. So what's changed? The amorphous aqueous solubility uh, has gone now from 10 to 100. So with, with a drug like this, with uh, the solubility challenge being high crystal lattice energy and not lipophilicity, you oftentimes experience much greater amorphous solubility enhancement. Um, Log P is no longer four, it's one. Typically, these aren't lithophilic compounds. They're more, uh, uh, their solubility is equally poor in both water and optimal. And uh, permeability, uh, not as high. Lipophilicity usually lends itself as good in terms of permeability. So the loss in that lipophilicity um, has, has reduced our permeability. So looking at the same table again, um, with the with the three crystalline cases at, with reducing reduced particle size, what you see is the dissolution number is greater than the PN over DO, um, even at the large particle size. So by increasing your DN, um, you're not making any difference in uh, in what the rate limiting step is. It's already solubility uh, limited. Um, at the large particle size. So by, by micronizing, you have no impact. Um, and and I, I guess let me point out the things that have changed. The dose number 
is now much higher, is 200, and that's as a result of the uh, lack of micellar drug because our log P is decreased. Um, also, the permeation number is decreased as well um, because, again, the permeability is uh, reduced due to the lack of lipophilicity. So we've got a much lower fraction of absorbed prediction and we're solubility limited even, even at the large particle size. So moving to the amorphous form, um, th this is a case where the amorphous form is kind of a high risk reward. Um, most people think of brick dust as risk for precipitation and that's absolutely true. Um, with a greater amorphous solubility enhancement, you also have a greater uh, propensity for that drug to, to precipitate to the crystalline form. However, um, it, it, you, you do get potentially large gains because uh, that amorphous enhancement is so high. So you see what happens to the dose number. It goes from 200 to 3 and is no longer a significantly limiting case. The PN over DO value is now 2.5 instead of uh, 0.03. So now the DN is much higher. Um, it is not as uh, high compared to the PN over DO as it was before, and that PN over DO value is no longer as limiting. It is solubility limited still and will be a problem as dose increases over 100 mg. But um, at this dose, the amorphous enhancement is, is very apparent in that we predict 100% fraction absorbed. So um, performance considerations in the bottom left. Gastric precipitation is neutral. That, so it, they're similar to what I had called out on the, on the last example, but precipitation risk is much greater in this case because of that higher um, amorphous enhancement. Um, so a gastric intestinal transfer, if basic, gastric pH effect, if basic, organic solvent solubility, that, that's a big one. Um, drugs that are like this um, tend not to dissolve in anything, so spray drying can be difficult um, if, uh, in, in these cases. And again, we have enabling technology where we use superheated solutions um, prior to atomization to, to dissolve that. Um, to dissolve the, the you know, poorly soluble drug, as well as permeability. And, and that's kind of, I say possibly because I've written permeability as, as a limiting factor, and, and sometimes in these cases it is uh, an important, and sometimes it's not as important. And it, it's just a matter of a case-by-case -case basis. Um, next is the, uh, the final example I'll show. So a brick dust compound that's weakly acidic. And what, what, what difference that makes is the crystalline um, aqueous solubility at neutral pH is now much higher due to the charge state at neutral pH. So now it's 100 microgram per mil. Um, amorphous solubility enhancement is still very high, um, so about 3,000. I, I kind of just made that up, but we, we do, do often see enhancement factors for drugs like this to be um, upwards of 30 and, and you know, up to about 100. And then permeability is decreased, so now it's an order, order of magnitude worse. And again, the reason for that is because now we're carrying a charge at, uh, at intestinal pH, and, uh, and that charge uh, compromises that drug's ability to permeate across the epithelium. So what does that do to these uh, parameters? Well, for, first, uh, for the crystalline, the dose number is much lower. Um, in the last case, it was 200, and now it's 2, and that's because the, it is more soluble because it's charged in, in the intestine. Um, the permeability number is much lower, um, 0.7, again, because the permeability is in compromise. And the dissolution number is already much higher um, because it has higher solubility, and, and uh, as you decrease particle size, it should dissolve faster. It is still solubility limited um, with an emphasis on epithelial uh, permeation, again, because permeability across the epithelium with the charged molecule is substantially rate limiting. When you add the amorphous form to the equation, um, the dose number is now 0 0.1 because our solubility, amorphous solubility is about 3 mg per mil. So with this dose, um, we're able to dissolve the entire dose in, in one, less than one turnover, a tenth of a turnover. And so um, because that dose number is now below one, it puts it into the permeability limited regime. And uh, at that point, when you're in this permeability limited 
region. Um, solubilization is no longer effective. Um, you're, you're kind of at the, you're kind of the best you can do in terms of solubilization technology. At that point, you'd need to be looking at ways to uh, increase permeability. Um, other performance considerations, gastric precipitation is a big one. Um, you have poor solubility in the gastric and uh, good solubility in the intestine. So that um, you may supersaturate and precipitate in the gastric phase. Organic solubility, again, like the, like the previous case, this is just not soluble in, in anything uh, in the neutral state, so that's a challenge. And permeability, obviously, is, is an issue. So this slide, uh, once, we've, once we've done that, those types of analyses, um, it, now, now we're looking to make some formulations and, and uh, address the problem statement with some of our in vitro tests. So three common problem statements that I've kind of discussed are precipitation, dissolution, rate limitation, solubility, permeability limitation. Um, different mechanisms in which that can, that can be the case. So precipitation, kind of like a, a neutral versus a weekly basic. Um, you, you supersaturate, but in different ways. In, in the case of a weekly basic drug, you'll dissolve a lot in the gastric and have to sustain that upon transfer. Um, whereas, you know, so, some weekly basic neutral compounds just just our fast crystallizers regardless of pH. We have many in vitro tools to kind of tackle each of these problem statements um, and tailor them to the specific molecule. Um, and, I'll, and I'll get into some of these here in the last 10 minutes or so. so here, are, here are the four tests that we commonly use um, for, for uh, characterizing the SDDs um, and, and tailoring to the problem statements. Amorphous solubility, actually this is done more in pre-formulation. We, we, we do this amorphous solubility test to see what, what do we expect from the amorphous form um, before we make any amorphous dispersion. And then the three on the right are, are tests designed for the actual dispersion powder themselves. Um, dissolution, using the pion system it has been really great. Um, things you can get from it, dissolution rate, precipitation rate, as well as speciation across the, the dissolution profile. So what's my free drug? What's my drug in my cells? What's my colloid concentration early, middle, and, and later on in the, in the test? And that, that level of information is very informative. The flux test, um, which, which tells you a few things. One, it's, it's a really good measurement of what your free drug is. And uh, second, um, what, what, what the, what's the contribution of the micelles, the colloids, and the free drug to uh, boundary layer diffusion, unsured water layer diffusion, and, and, and diffusion across the epithelium? <clears throat> and finally, control transfer. Um, this is a, similar to an artificial stomach and duodenum test where um, we're controlling the rate at which the gastric flows into the, uh, the intestinal phase. So first, the amorphous solubility test, what we do is we dissolve the drug in an organic um, at a high concentration and titrate it into a bioirrelevant media and measure a couple of things. One, at what point do we stop getting more drug into solution? So that, that's, that's evident by the fact that we're not getting any more drug in solution despite titrating it in at higher concentration, as well as an onset of scattering, which is a sign that you've hit the amorphous solubility. And, um, and then eventually precipitation will occur. So we run this test um, without any polymer pre-dissolved to, to get a sense of what the precipitation kinetics are, what the amorphous solubility is, and then we also do it with pre-dissolved polymer um, so that we can assess how good is this polymer at preventing crystallization. And, and that is a, um, one of the things that we use before we make any formulations to, to decide what polymers we're going to use. The second is a dissolution using the pion probe. So again, dissolution and precipitation uh, rate kinetics are really important. Um, speciation across the entire profile is important. So we can take samples from the uh, from the dissolution media and 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 determine what the free drug concentration is, what the micelle concentration is, and, and if there's any colloids. Third is membrane flux. Um, what, what I've got here is an example of um, 
a paper that a colleague of mine, Aaron Stewart, has written describing how the flux test was used to uh, select a formulation for itraconazole. And, uh, and, and it actually turned out that this test was discriminating and correlated to in vivo results. And that, that paper is listed on the bottom there. But in this case, um, what's tested is the Sporinox, so a non-colloid forming SDD, HPMC, versus two, um, I think, HPMCAS uh, L and H grade. And what was found is that the L grade had higher flux because it formed more colloids, and those colloids for a lipophilic drug were contributing to the flux and, again, correlated in vivo. And uh, this test did an, uh, a really good job at, at discriminating formulations. And again, I'll point out, itraconazole represents an SLU case, similar to the case one that I presented where um, for very lipophilic drugs, you're looking to get as many solubilized species in solution as possible to resupply that, those free drug levels so that the drug can permeate. Here's, here's a little decision tree on, on the flux itself. Um, based on the data, the test you run and the data that you're getting, What's the problem statement and what approaches can you take? So if you do the flux test um, with my cells uh, and the flux does not increase as a function of dose, that's a sign that your boundary layer limited. But if it does increase with dose, you're, you're both boundary layer and dissolution rate limited. Um, and so the, the two approaches you may take are, are slightly different. And in the case where um, uh, without my cells uh, and you get flux that increases with dose or, or not, that, that tells you something else. So permeability enhancing excipients are, are, are important. Finally, uh, the control transfer dissolution. And what, what's, what's uh, great about this test is for fast crystallizers, um, you get a little more information on uh, a biorelevant um, gastric emptying. So this test shown here is for erlotinib and uh, model compound. And, and the dose in the gastric is 300 microgram per mil. Um, normally, if you run like a, a, a typical gastric transfer test, you'd go from 300 mil gastric to maybe a, a 150 or a, do, do a two-fold dilution. Well, in, in, uh, in reality, if you have a gastric dose that high, you don't actually get those high of concentrations um, in the intestinal phase. So this, uh, this controls that rate that, that's a bio-relevant rate at which gastric is, is going into the intestine. There's a little, there's a good schematic on the right that kind of shows how that test is run as well as a picture. But what we're doing is we're, we're measuring the drug in the intestinal phase while introducing the drug from the gastric phase as well as the uh, like fresh sift, and we're keeping that volume constant. So in, in the plot here on the left, um, you've got you've got the solid line here that that depicts the drug that you're adding into the intestinal phase. So this profile is reminiscent of what happens in the, in the bioirrelevant situations in vivo where the gastric emptying rate has a half-life of 15 minutes. Um, the red curve is erlotinib with HPMC pre-dissolved, and the black curve is erlotinib by itself. And what you see is the HPMC has a sustaining influence here versus the erlotinib uh, crystalline alone. And that, um, th th this is one example of where this test comes in handy is Determining those precipitation kinetics in a bio-relevant way. Um, there are other, there are a few other things that you can get out of this, such as precipitation in the gastric phase, which you're not directly measuring, but you can tell that that's happening, as well as um, uh, dissolution rate. Um, poorly slow dissolving uh, formulations would would not uh, the, the concentrations that you're measuring would not match up to the solid line. And then we, it's really discriminating um, for dissolution rates. I kind of went through that quickly. Um, and again, I'm happy to discuss offline with whoever's interested. So here, here, here's a summary of what I said. Um, typical advantage of an SDD is broad applicability for many API properties, a diverse property space. Um, very little API required for early feasibility, as low as 100 MIGs. And we can usually Manufacture formulation um, and deliver deliver uh, PK supplies and do so, uh, some some characterization. Um, SEDs are applicable to formulation in tablets and capsules, applicable to controlled release and, and combo formulations, 
uh, readily scalable across a huge range from feasibility all the way to, to commercial. And we have uh, enabling technologies for, for compounds that historically um, have been difficult to spray dry, so brick dust type compounds. Um, and the expertise that we have on SDD formulations are um, early and comprehensive problem statement definition from a performance stability and manufacturability perspective. Um, and I went through that in my pre-formulation pre assessment section. Um, many in vitro performance tests that we tailor to the specific problem statement, as well as um, we try and do all of that decision making and, and tailoring um, in a collaborative way with the client, because the client does know the compound better than anyone, and we want to leverage that uh, information as best as we can. And uh, I think that's it. Thank you for listening. Turn it over to Rita. All right, well, thank you very much, Ethan, for that informative presentation. Uh, we're going to get to our Q&A in one moment, but first I'd like to get our audience to participate in a quick polling question. You can uh, select your answer directly on the screen and click Submit. So the question is, do you have a current project that you would like to discuss with Lonza? Yes or no? Um, so just make your selection. Uh, do you have a current project that you would like to discuss with Lonza? Yes or no? So you can make your selection and click Submit. And while you're doing that, just like to remind you for our Q&A that you can submit your question by typing it in the Q&A box, which can be found on the right-hand side of the presentation window. And we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. And uh, let's jump into the first one. Uh, so Ian, how long does it take and how much API to get uh, a lead formulation for SDD technology feasibility assessment uh, and in vitro read, or a preclinal PK, or talk study? Yeah, thanks. Um, so API amount, I'll start with that, it's pretty flexible. It can be done with as little as, as 100 milligrams of API, like I said, and that typically includes API assessment. We, we've scaled down the amorphous solubility test so that we can um, do that even with very limiting API amounts. Um, typically one SDD formulation that we decide um, from that. Um, some limited testing, so physical physical characterization like DSC, for instance, um, identifying a suspension, and then maybe um, leftover would be a couple hundred MIGs of SDD for an, an in vivo rat study. Um, so that, that's kind of on the low end. A, a good amount is about maybe one to five grams where we can use the lab scale dryer and make a, a few formulations at one to five grams. Um, more still is, is, is obviously better. Um, it, it, we can support larger animal um, PK supplies in the first round of screening without having to remake it, so that saves a little time and money. Um, <clears throat> Time from beginning the API measurement to PK supplies can be short as two to three weeks. Um, that's pretty fast, and it usually assumes that uh, a lot of uh, not not a lot of formulation work might go into it, but we want to just get a, a read. But I, I would say normally, from a, a typical program, when we receive the API and get started, um, by the time we do the assessment, manufacture the formulations, and uh, and, and, and identify a lead and get that into animals is about four to eight weeks, depending on the scope, so thank you. All right, thank you. Um, here's, here's our next question. It's got a couple parts to it. So uh, how much physicochemical information is needed from the client versus what is generated at Lonza? Is this flexible as to whether Lonza or client provides the data? And what is Lonza's preference? Okay. Um, yeah, so I'd say the most important data is uh, the structure, and we use the structure to do a number of calculations like permeability, diffusion coefficient, things like that that I mentioned. Um, crystalline solubility, which oftentimes is provided, but we, we uh, measure it, and usually we measure it in bio-relevant media that we're uh, familiar with, um, like Dressman buffer type of formulation or uh, uh, solutions. 
Amorphous solubility, which we typically measure, a dose, dosing range, which is provided by the client, um, what, what the animal model is, oftentimes provided by the client. Um, log P, uh, a micelle partitioning is important, uh, which can both be either calculated or measured. We typically measure a micelle partition coefficient, bile salt micelle partition coefficient specifically. Um, permeability, which can be calculated um, or, or uh, client provided. Um, and thermal properties, which is something we also measure. Um, other things that are important that are not necessary but useful, PK data, uh, force degradation, any, any permeability data, um, metabolism, those are nice to have but not necessarily, not, we don't need them and, and usually not available in, in the preclinical very early stage and, and those things we just develop as we go forward. Okay, thank you. Um, next up, um, in practice, how well can you predict the potential enhancement in BA for an SDD versus crystalline before running in, in vivo PK studies? Yeah, um, predicting the actual enhancement is pretty hard, and we we don't really try that hard early on because you know it's a hard thing to predict with no basis, but um, what we do do is, is kind of try and develop an expectation for, for what um, what we might expect out of the amorphous form versus the crystalline form. Um, and, and of course, if we're wrong, um, oftentimes we are. We, 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 we expect something in, in, in the PK, the PK study, we see something different. We, we want to use that data to refine problem statement and start designing the tests that um, understand that problem. And actually, that, that, adds, that adds a bit of fun and excitement from a formulation science perspective because we, we like to learn as much as we can and we learn a lot from, from um, situations that we, we don't expect. Okay, thanks. Uh, here, here's uh, we have time for about two more questions. So, here's one: Is it typical for you to do PBPK modeling during pre-formulation, early formulation, and how useful do you find it? Um, we don't typically dive into rigorous biomodeling modeling until after the first PK study. Um, we do, like I mentioned, the FACS and, and MAD calculations. But um, you know, some some programs have a lot of PK data to go through and, and have different levels of biomodeling associated, and, and some are very early and don't have anything. So um, we we have the capability to do um, that type of biomodeling, and uh, if if the program dictates it, then we we'll, we certainly look to to support that. All right, um, here's the next question. All right, you were speaking about gastric precipitation or low pH. Could you please discuss the possibilities for molecules with high solubility at the gastric, the low pH, and precipitation at higher pH in the intestine? All right, thanks for that. So for weakly basic compounds, uh, solubility is very high in the gastric phase. So oftentimes we're not super saturating. Um, so it, it, it's not, gastric precipitation is not important um, for drugs with. For, so I guess in those cases, what you're looking for is um, a formulation that can sustain the super saturation after it's basically transferred from a high solubility environment to a low solubility environment. HPNCAS is a really good polymer for that. Um, it's not always the best, but in our experience, it, it happens to be among the best um, most of the time. So it, that, that's something that we would definitely look for. In cases where um, you're not a weak base, you're a neutral or an acidic compound, the, uh, the solubility is low in the gastric phase, and so HPNCAS might not be the best option because it's insoluble at gastric pH, and so the drug will come out of the formulation um, and supersaturate, you know, many times without a sustaining polymer dissolve. 
So in those cases, you either want to formulate it with a polymer that can dissolve in the at gastric pH, so some of the neutral ones I mentioned, HPMC, PVPVA, et cetera. Um, or one, one strategy we found that it has some success is using um, one of the very acidic polymers like the Oidrigit uh, methyl methacrylate polymer where um, it's very insoluble and it prevents the drug, it can prevent the drug from coming out in the gastric phase altogether. So um, what you're trying to avoid is precipitated drug being transferred to the intestine and you've already lost your solubility advantage. Hopefully that answered the question. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ian. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time. If we didn't get to your question here, it will be followed up uh, with uh, offline. I'd like to thank the audience for attending and participating in today's event, and I'd like to thank our sponsor, Lanza Pharma and Biotech, Biotech excuse me, for making today's webcast possible. This program will be available for on-demand viewing through March of 2019. You'll receive an email from Pharmaceutical Technology alerting you when the webcast will be available for replay. I invite you to forward that announcement to any colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thank you for joining us, and have a great rest of your day.